this class will discuss um, both uh, lecture two and lecture three, which deals with the role of music in church, its expression and formation, uh, and also the structure of the mass. In our intro to the course, we talked about what music moves you. Uh, and you gave me your idea of how music can have power. Um, it can have power to change your mood. It can recall memories. Uh, it can transport you to another place. Um, music is very, very powerful, as we all know in our own experience. And it's important to keep this in mind as we discuss liturgical music, because it should evoke many of those elements that we discussed in which music is meaningful to you at this moment in your life. Now, we also, uh, I also had you watch uh, a number of videos uh, which dealt with the structure of the mass and how to understand it, uh, and then a historical perspective on the mass prior to the Second Vatican Council. And then also I had you watch a series of videos which dealt with ritual and music that had nothing to do with the mass. So there was the ritual of the Olympic torch lighting um, and what that symbolizes. And it is a global symbol that uh, everyone of a certain age on earth understands that when the Olympic torch is lit, it signifies the beginning of the Olympic Games. I also had you watch um, some Super Bowl national anthem videos as a more national scale. Um, and which one did you prefer of the national anthem? Was it the one that was being performed for you, which was very elaborate with an orchestration, perhaps um, a star celebrity singer, or was it the one where the people all sang together? Um, both have value and both have meaning um, and both can evoke a strong emotion of patriotism. Uh, I also had you watch um, some videos uh, dealing with the football game, um, one that uh, was a graduation ceremony that was really horrible. Uh, and then I had you watch probably the most important video uh, of these non-related videos, which was um, a birthday party and watching um, that ritual unfold because we all understand it, right? And I want you to consider the role of the happy birthday song. Uh, and its meaning. And if you've ever been to a birthday party, of course, I'm sure we all have, and sung happy birthday, or the cake comes out and we're going to sing happy birthday. Um, and this is all, you know, showing love to whosoever birthday it is. And we all sing happy birthday. Now, I want you to think about that. Uh, do you ever evaluate how well you sing happy birthday? Probably not. Most people, if they do, they just kind of laugh it off like, oh, you know, that wasn't the greatest. Or some people might, you know, if it was really, really good, some people might go, wow, that was amazing. What we all feel about the happy birthday song and uh, the person whose birthday it is, is the love that we share for them. And I want you to think about this in relation to liturgical music. Because a lot of people say to me, uh, you know, I don't sing at church because I don't have a good voice. But can you imagine someone saying that at a birthday party? And you say to your friend whose birthday it is, um, I'm not going to sing happy birthday because I don't have a really good voice. I mean, no one would say that. It doesn't matter whether you have a good voice or not, right? Um, it matters how much you love the person whose birthday it is. And I want you to consider that for liturgical music. Um, does it matter whether or not you can sing? Well, no. What matters is the love that um, we have for God, the love that we have for uh, Jesus. That is the, the quality. It doesn't matter whether you can sing well or not. 
And you can also consider the ritual of the birthday party, you know, and what goes into that, you know, planning a surprise birthday party for someone. There's a lot more planning involved, right? Um, getting the cake, getting your present, keeping it secret, communicating with people, um, you know, and then even just the ritual of bringing out the birthday cake, you know, lighting the candles on it, making sure that there's the appropriate number of candles on the birthday cake, uh, singing happy birthday, making a wish, blowing out the candles, um, you know, maybe a little applause after the candles are, are blown out. And then, of course, asking what the person wished for. Um, not supposed to reveal that. And you think about all the rituals that go into that and trying to explain that to somebody. It doesn't make sense to explain that ritual to people because we all understand it. And that's, in a sense, like the Mass. It is a ritual that is experienced week after week, year after year. It doesn't need a whole lot of explanation. So as we begin this portion of the, of the class and we talk about the structure of the Mass, a lot of um, students of mine who are Catholic might go, oh, well, I go to church every Sunday or I've been to church, you know, when I was in Catholic school and I hated it and I know what the structure is. Well, most people, most Catholics actually don't know what the structure of the Mass is and they don't necessarily understand it because it is experienced week after week, year after year. And that's kind of the whole reason for it. I mean, the whole... Uh, not reason, but the whole intent is that it becomes a part of your being, right? It becomes a part of who you are. And so those of you who may not be Roman Catholic um, or who may not be Christian, you're going to come at this with, you know, completely new eyes. And I would ask that same thing of the Catholic students in the class, because you will really gain a lot of knowledge by trying to explore these different parts of the mass and how they connect to one another and how they connect to the story of Jesus and God's saving um, plan throughout history. So let's start at um, the beginning. So what is liturgy? You might've heard this word. Well, it um, means in English, the work of the people. And it comes from a Greek word, uh, liturgia. You may have seen or may have heard um, people referred to as laity or lay people. Well, you can see in the very beginning of that word, L-E-I, uh, that is the word people in uh, Greek. So liturgia means the work of the people. And liturgy is really an established formula or prescribed ritual. Um, and if you think about uh, this, many, many Christian churches use liturgy, a prescribed ritual, even if they say they don't have a ritual. Um, a lot of evangelical churches will say, you know, we don't do ritual. And they really don't, but there usually is some kind of order of service that is generally followed. And now you consider how were the videos that I had you watch, especially the ones that were not um, related to the mass, how were those videos, videos liturgy? And you think about the birthday uh, video, as I mentioned, the, what goes into that, and that there is, especially in a birthday party, there is this prescribed ritual uh, that takes place. You have a birthday cake, you have candles on the birthday cake. They have a certain number of candles on the birthday cake. They are lit. They are, you know, the birthday, per, um, the lights are turned out. Uh, the cake is brought in with the candles lit on it. Think about all those steps that go into a birthday party. Those are all an established formula. It's like a liturgy. So now we talk about liturgical music. I mean, this is the reason for the course, liturgical music. So why do we call it liturgical? Why don't we call it uh, sacred music or religious music? Um, each of these kind of can be used interchangeably with varying meanings, but liturgical music specifically is sacramental. It is a an outward sign of an inward grace. 
Um, and music has power. Music has power to communicate. It brings us together in community and it assists us in ritual. In the liturgy, music glorifies God and it sanctifies the people. It should be festive and enhances the proclamation of God's word. It strengthens communal bonds between the people of God. It promotes uh, participation, either uh, internal participation or exterior participation, and it should foster the cultural good. So now let's get into the structure of the mass and its parts. And I wanna begin this with a reading from uh, the Gospel of Luke, in which recounts the story of Emmaus. So this comes from the 24th chapter of Luke, beginning with the 13th verse. That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place there in these days? And he replied to them, what sort of things? They said to him, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, how our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke! Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them, and it happened that he was with them at table. He took the bread and said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. But he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way? and opened the scriptures to us. So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This section of the Gospel of Luke which occurs after Jesus' resurrection, is in a sense for us an understanding of the two integral parts of the Mass. When it really comes down to it, the two most important parts of the Mass are Christ present in the Word of God and in the bread broken and cup shared in the Eucharist. So where are those two parts? Well, Jesus walking along the road, and then at the point where he says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, really 
for Jews, that signifies the scriptures, right? Because Moses wrote the five books of the Pentateuch, the Torah, and all the prophets. So this really indicates that he opened the scriptures to them and interpreted what referred to him. And then, of course, that's pretty apparent. Um, then, of course, he sits with them at table. He takes the bread and blesses it and breaks it and gives it to them. And that is when their eyes were opened. And this is a symbol for us as the Eucharist. And so I want to begin here with this understanding of the Eucharist as word or the liturgy, uh, the mass as word and sacrament. So we know that liturgy is the work of the people. It is an overarching term that doesn't just refer to the mass. It can also refer to the liturgy of the hours or also known as the divine office. Um, the mass comes with a number of different uh, titles, if you will, uh, and different sources. People call it the mass. People call it the divine um, liturgy. People call it the Eucharist. Uh, people call it the breaking of the bread or they call it the Lord's Supper. Um, Catholics usually call it the mass or the Eucharist. And it comes from partly the Jewish Seder meal, which happens at Passover. Uh, also, there's elements of the Shabbat welcoming meal. Uh, and then there's also elements um, from the synagogue service of readings and chants. If you think about the uh, early Christians, they didn't have the Mass um, in its current form for quite a while. And so they still attended synagogue and they were of course used to that where there would be readings and chants and things like that. Um, and so the Christians continued to do this. The early Christians continued to meet in synagogue and have this liturgy of the word uh, and then would have the breaking of the bread to reenact the Lord's supper and to reenact this Christ sacrifice uh, on the cross. Um, it is also known as the breaking of the bread. Uh, these are kind of all ways that we can refer to um, liturgy or the mass. Now, in that reading, I gave you the two main parts, but there really are four parts to the liturgy. Um, there's the entrance rite, the liturgy of the word, the liturgy of the Eucharist, and then finally the concluding rite. So let's take a look at each of these rites. The entrance rite begins with an entrance song or chant. Uh, then there's the introduction by the priest, the penitential rite, uh, which includes the singing of the Kyrie eleison, which is Greek for Lord have mercy. And then there's the singing of the Gloria hymn, uh, which has very ancient roots um, and is also referred to in the, uh, the story of Christmas, uh, the nativity of the Lord, when the angels appeared to the shepherds abiding by their flocks <laughs> at night, and they come singing Gloria in excelsis Deo, glory to God in the highest, announcing the birth of the Messiah. And finally, the entrance rite concludes with the collect. Um, this collect is... Um, a prayer spoken by the priest. He begins by saying, let us pray. And then there's silent prayer for the people to pray. Uh, and then he, the priest will speak a, uh, a prayer that's been uh, prescribed for that day. And it really collects all the unspoken prayers of the people. And finally, the people assent with an amen. And then we move into the Liturgy of the Word, which begins with um, a reading, for, usually from Hebrew scriptures, um, the Old Testament. Uh, but inside the Easter season, it's usually taken from the Acts of the Apostles. But all throughout the year, um, outside of Easter, it's from the Hebrew scriptures. And it's important to know in the Liturgy of the Word that uh, after Vatican II, we now have a three-year cycle of readings for Sundays. They're known as year A, B, and C. 
And year A focuses on the gospel of Matthew, year B focuses on the gospel of Mark, and year C focuses on the gospel of Luke. So you might ask yourself, well, where is the gospel of John? There are four gospels. Well, the gospel of John is read for special feasts and usually during the Easter season. Uh, so the gospel of John is kind of spread out. So following the the um, reading from Hebrew scriptures, we have the psalm, which is also known as the gradual, uh, that takes uh, its name from, uh, gradual takes its name from the steps where it used to be sung. So in Latin, uh, gratis means steps, it used to be sung on the steps. Um, but the psalm is taken from any number of the 150 psalms by, uh, that we attribute to uh, King David. Um, and sometimes those psalms are taken from other parts of the scriptures, but it's still referred to as the psalm. Uh, and then we have another reading, which com usually comes from a, a letter from one of the apostles. Most often it comes from uh, St. Paul, who wrote uh, a number of uh, letters in the New Testament, uh, which are part of the, uh, the scriptures. Uh, but they can also come from other letters that are associated with apostles. After that reading, then we, um, we have the big moment of the Liturgy of the Word, which begins with the reading of the Gospel. And so the reading of the Gospel has an acclamation which is sung. Um, uh, and it's usually the Alleluia, but during Lent, the Alleluia is not sung. Uh, they use some other words um, in place of the Alleluia. Uh, but everyone stands, there can be candles, there can be incense, there can be a long procession uh, while the gospel acclamation is being sung. Uh, and then the deacon will read the gospel, a section of one of the four gospels is read or sometimes it's sung for very special occasions. Uh, following the gospel, we have the homily, which is different from a sermon. A uh, homily uh, is uh, usually preached by a priest or bishop or deacon, um, and it explains the, or helps to apply the readings from scriptures to our everyday lives. Um, so we don't refer to it in the Catholic Church as a sermon, because that has a little different uh, meaning. Following the homily, the people get to a sense uh, and uh, say the creed. Uh, this can also be sung as well. Uh, but most often in the United States, this is spoken by all of the people. And there are two different forms of the creed. There's the Nicene Creed, and then there's the more ancient Apostles' Creed, which is a little bit shorter. Uh, and then we have the Prayer of the Faithful. This section <laughs> goes by many different names. It's called the Prayer of the Faithful. It can be called the General Intercessions. It can be called the Universal Prayer. Um, I actually heard someone refer to it as the bidding prayers. Um, so we usually call it the prayer of the faithful. And that closes out the liturgy of the word. Let's move on to the liturgy of the Eucharist. So the liturgy of the Eucharist begins with the preparation of the gifts, also called the offertory. Um, and then we have the Eucharistic prayer or canon. Um, oh, let me go back to the preparation of the gifts. So for our class, um, our study of liturgical music, usually this is a part of the mass, the preparation of the gifts, when the collection is being taken up, the bread and wine are being offered. This is usually a part where um, if there's a choir present, they're going to sing some really beautiful piece. So I want you to pay attention to this part of the mass, even though it seems like it's um, ritually, it's not that important in the overall thing, but musically it can be actually very important. So just pay attention to what the choir is singing or maybe the organist is playing or maybe there's a solo. It's usually a beautiful part of music, hopefully. Uh, so we have the Eucharistic prayer or canon, which I'll go into a little bit more detail later. Um, canon refers to, um, this is kind of the law of belief for the church. Following the Eucharistic prayer, we have the communion rite, which contains a number of different elements. It begins with the Lord's Prayer, or the Our Father. Then there's a sign of peace, which is exchanged among the people. And then we go into the fraction rite, or the Agnus Dei is sung there. 
uh, that's when the priest uh, breaks the bread and maybe um, uh, distributes, that uh, no, doesn't distribute that, but uh, the priest breaks the bread. And then there is the communion procession. This is when the people come forward to receive uh, the body and blood of Christ. And then following the uh, communion procession, there is a prayer after communion, and then oftentimes a hymn of thanksgiving, which concludes the liturgy of the Eucharist. Some churches don't do the hymn of thanksgiving. Um, they'll do uh, a closing hymn, but the church actually says that a hymn of thanksgiving is a good idea here. So now let's go and talk about the canon or the Eucharistic prayer. This is kind of the highlight of the entire liturgy. And it is the center and summit of the entire um, liturgy, the entire Eucharist. And it has a number of different parts, which you don't have to know each one of them, but it begins with an introductory dialogue um, where the priests you know, and the people respond back and forth. There's usually a Thanksgiving. And then following the Thanksgiving, this is where we have a musical element, which is known as the Sanctus, or the Holy, Holy, Holy. And we'll hear a couple of these examples later on. After the Holy, 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 uh, there's um, a section called the Epiclesis, when the priest calls down upon the, calls the Holy Spirit down upon uh, the gifts of bread and wine. Uh, and then there's the institution narrative, this um, is called a, the institution narrative because it's the institution of the, um, the ritual that we're celebrating at this moment, um, the Last Supper. Um, and so we have that section there, which is very important. And then following that, we have an acclamation, uh, which is sung by the people. After that, we have um, this anemnesis, which is really a a recollection or um, literally means a loss of forgetfulness. <laughs> Think about that for a second. But this memorial prayer of remembrance recalls for the worshiping community past events in their tradition of faith that are formative for their identity and self-understanding. Um, and then following the anemnesis, we have an offering. There are intercessions. Uh, and then finally, the Eucharistic prayer concludes with the doxology. And then the doxology, this word comes from the Greek, um, which is uh, kind of a, gl a glorifying. And doxologies are all throughout the Eucharist, um, all throughout the, um, the Mass. There's different formulas, but this is the most elaborate one. And the priest usually sings this one. So it kind of highlights the importance of this um, doxology. And you can see that there. Through him, with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. And the people respond, Amen, or in some other way. And that Amen is usually called the Great Amen. And the priest and deacon lift up the bread and the wine, which has now become the body and blood of Christ. And they lift it high um, as a symbol of offering it to God the Father. So that is the liturgy of the Eucharist and the canon and Eucharistic prayer in more detail. Finally, we have the fourth part of the Mass, which is called the concluding rite. And usually there are some announcements um, about the community. Um, there's a blessing, and then there is the dismissal. Ite misa est, that <laughs> went away really quick. Uh, but ite misa est in English means go, the Mass is ended. Uh, and it gives the name to the Mass, misa, or Mass in English. All right, let's move on to the roles at Mass. There are a number of different roles, and it's important for us to understand those. So there are three orders in the Catholic Church. Uh, it's hierarchical. So there's bishops, uh, presbyters, and deacons. And these three 
names, these three orders, the names of the three orders come from the Greek. So there's the bishop, and you can see here in this image, the bishop is uh, wearing a special uh, headgear called a mitre, and he's holding uh, a staff, which looks like a shepherd's hook, which is called a crozier. Um, and bishop comes from the Greek word meaning overseer. And then you see, uh, then we have presbyters, and this person is on the left side with the stole, which descends on both sides of his body. Um, presbyters comes from the Greek word meaning elders. And in English, we normally call these uh, people priests. So you could say priests, right? It's, it's um, kind of the same thing. Um, but presbyters comes from the Greek meaning elder. And then finally, the third order we have is deacon. And deacons wear the stole and he's on the right side. And the deacons have a stole which goes from one shoulder off to the other side. And deacon comes from the Greek word meaning servant. So these are the three orders. Um, you might have heard of cardinals or archbishop or pope or uh, monsignor. These are all varying things within these three orders. All right, the next role we're going to talk about is the liturgical assembly. Liturgical assembly, that is all of us and is very important uh, in the celebration of the Mass because we are God's people, a royal priesthood. Uh, and it's important to remember that the liturgical assembly has a very important role at Mass, right? Sure, priests can have Mass by themselves with, you know, uh, but really that's not normal normative right it's normative to have a liturgical assembly which shows the full which has full conscious and active participation by the people and then let's talk about some other roles at mass the liturgical sorry the music ministers there are different kinds of music ministers there's the the choir there's the psalmist there's the cantor you can see here um there's the organist, there's the director of music ministries. So many different roles uh, and in the mass for uh, music ministers. And then, you know, we're obviously as a music course, we're very concerned about these guys, the choir and what makes it up, um, the psalmist uh, and cantor, uh, the organist and the director of music ministries, who is the person who usually is curates the um, the music which is sung at mass. Now, here's an, a diagram which I kind of like because even though the church is hierarchical, um, this kind of shows it more flattened out in a way I think which is uh, good for us to understand the church. If, so if you consider uh, this the worldwide church, um, you could consider that blue dot being um, the church in Rome, headed by uh, the Pope, uh, the Bishop of Rome. And then out there, uh, out coming out from that are the various dioceses around the church, around the world. Um, but you could also consider this uh, as a diocese with the bishop in the center and the local parishes coming out from there with the different parish ministries. Or you could even consider this hierarchy or this symbol, this image to denote a particular parish with the pastor of the church at the center with a, a pastoral council, a various ministries of the parish with the various people involved in the parish. And you see how they are collaborating with one another, uh, which is the whole idea of the body of Christ, which uh, St. Paul talks about the body of Christ and that we need each other to uh, affect the work of building the kingdom of God, which was a major uh, teaching of Jesus, this bringing about the kingdom of God, the reign of God, a just world. 
All right, so let's go into the musical elements of the mass. So we can group these musical elements into two uh, main segments. So there's the ordinaries and the ordinaries are those things, those prayers and songs, um, texts, which are constant for each Sunday of the year. There's the Kyrie, which we talked about before, Lord have mercy, um, the Gloria, the Credo, the Sanctus, and the Agnuste. These prayers uh, do not change from week to week. The other um, grouping we can call the propers, and those things are things that do change from week to week, from Sunday to Sunday, from day to day, actually. Um, and those are the entrance chant, the gradual or the psalm, the alleluia, the text usually changes, even though the words of the alleluia don't necessarily, um, the offertory, the preparation of gifts, and the communion. The propers all try to reflect upon the readings of scripture that which do change, right? The gospel in particular is the most important element, and it really uh, is the center of what the propers usually address. Um, what is the reading from this, from the gospel? So now let's break down some of the musical elements of the mass. Um, we have the entrance chant or entrance song, or also known as the introit. And it usually comes from a psalm or it can be a hymn. And it has a number of different purposes. It opens the liturgy. It unifies the people. Uh, it introduces the theme of the day, if you will. Theme, <laughs> I use in quotation marks. Um, but usually that theme is based upon the gospel. Uh, so it usually will introduce or have some kind of relationship to the gospel. And it is also accompanying the procession of the ministers um, into the sanctuary. Uh, and that really is a symbol of the people coming together to celebrate, to enter the, the sanctuary of God, the house of God. And I'm going to give you two different examples of that, and I'm going to talk over them so that I don't get into trouble. This first one. think it's going to play. So I guess we'll move on. But I had two examples. One is called Gather a Sin, which is a contemporary hymn uh, written by uh, composer Marty Haugen. Uh, and it really is a, um, the text is really great in that it accomplishes um, uh, three of the four purposes of the entrance chant or song. Um, then there's also, I was also going to play for you this chant for Christmas uh, Day, which is Puer Natus in Bethlehem, uh, which is a Gregorian chant, which uh, will help us introduce the liturgy of the Christmas uh, celebration, the nativity of, of Jesus. Um, so those are some examples in that, which I'm now going to move on to the Kyrie, since those didn't play. Um, next, we're going to talk about the musical element known as the Kyrie, which is, we, we can call this a litany because it is like a list. Kyrie, it's only three things, but Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. I mentioned before that it comes from uh, Greek, uh, and it literally means Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. Um, there is a popular basketball player whose name is Kyrie, and he has the same spelling, but I promise you this is pronounced Kyrie. It is tripartite, meaning there's three parts to it, and it usually is done in a call and response, either uh, three times or perhaps nine times, uh, with three statements of Kyrie eleison to begin, three statements of Christe eleison, and then three statements of Kyrie eleison. This is usually led by the deacon or cantor, 
or choir, uh, and sometimes the priest. I had an example, but it's not going to play. All right, let's move on to the Gloria. As I mentioned before, this is an ancient uh, hymn, uh, and it comes from, well, part of it comes from the Christmas section, uh, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to people of goodwill. And I had a beautiful <laughs> musical setting of this, but it did not play. Next, we'll talk about the responsorial psalm. It is responsorial, which means uh, it has a response built into it. Um, and it's taken from the 150 Psalms uh, and also the Canticles from Scripture. Uh, now I'm going to show you a little bit of a responsory. This is from the Easter Vigil. This is the chant, Cantemus Domino. Um, let's see if this one plays. The translation of this, this is following the reading from the book of Exodus where the um, the Israelites walk through the dry land. They walk through the Red Sea uh, on dry land. And this translation is, I will sing to the Lord for his gloriously triumphant horse and chariot he has cast into the sea. No luck on that. <laughs> okay. Next. Next, we have the Sanctus. This is within the Eucharistic prayer. And this comes from Isaiah's uh, vision of the heavenly throne of God. And that text in Hebrew, Kadosh, 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 Adonai Tzavaot, Melo Kol Haaretz Kavodo, which means in English, holy, 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 the Lord of hosts. The entire world is filled with God's glory. Now, I bring up the Hebrew because this does come from Isaiah's vision, but it's also important to note that this sanctus comes at the end of the um, preface to the Eucharistic prayer and just before the most important part of the Mass, which is um, the consecration of the bread and the wine into the body and blood of Christ. In the Hebrew, uh, in the synagogue, in the Jewish synagogue, the, um, the Kadosh is sung just prior to the opening of the Ark, which contains um, the Torah, the scrolls. Um, you can see that there is this um, connection to uh, the ancient celebration of the Christians back uh, uh, when they were still attending the synagogue services um, to this, to contemporary uh, time, right? The song is still sung. And that's important, I think, for us to remember because it connects us to our history. It connects us all the way back to the prophet Isaiah's vision of the heavenly throne. And I had some examples of the Kadosh being sung, I had some examples of the Sanctus being sung, and the Holy Holy. None of those are playing for me. So let's move on. To the Agnus Dei. Uh, this is the next musical element. Um, this also, uh, like the Kyrie, is tripartite. The English translation of Agnus Dei is Lamb of God. And it takes its... Um, imagery from the wedding feast of the Lamb from uh, the Revelation to St. John. And Christ is the Lamb of God. So I mentioned it is tripartite, like the Kyrie. Um, first two um, iterations of the Agnus Dei end with have mercy on us, and the final one ends with grant us peace. And then I have finally this Ite Misa Est, uh, which is the final dialogue of the Mass. Um, and since I don't have a recording of this, I'll sing the Easter example for you. So 
Um, Easter has the most elaborate dismissal. And that sounds like this. Go in the peace of Christ. Alleluia. Alleluia. And the people respond. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. A very beautiful way to end the Mass on Easter Sunday. Oftentimes this is spoken, um, but it's nice to hear the sung version. All right, so that is the conclusion of this portion of the class on the parts and structure of the Mass and its formation and expression.